Hey folks, it's Ash and as ever, I'm joined by Tim on the Calf Kick Sports Podcast. So when I was thinking of an intro for this, I was actually thinking of reasons as to what makes this main event matchup at UFC 270 so intriguing. It essentially just boils down to this. You know, you got Francis Ngannou. He's a guy that just needs his opponent to make one mistake and it's lights out. But Cyril Garland doesn't make any mistakes, man. This is a fight between an unstoppable force and an immovable or rather untouchable object. We're going to be breaking down Saturday night's fights as well. So that's between Cal Calvin Cater and Giga Chikadze. Firstly, man, Tim, how you been? Feels like ages. Yeah, it's actually weird that we've done, we've talked to a ton of people and we haven't actually done like an actual sit down interview in quite a while, uh, which is, or sorry, sit down podcast, which is what we should get back to doing. Cause it's something we're quite good at, but yeah, we've got lots of interviews on the channel. If you're a hardcore boy listening to a Cap Kick Sports podcast, make sure to check out the interviews. Cause you are the kind of person that would absolutely love that kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm excited for this heavyweight title fight. It's got some, some weight to it. The UFC heavyweight title has some prestige. It has some like, proper weight to it it's also i think one of the only ufc titles where the lineage is good like it, it, within the ufc heavyweight title is the ufc heavyweight title lineage the pride strike force ufc one is mixed in there there's a lot of really good titles in this in this championship the ufc heavyweight title fights it comes with prestige it comes with some electricity and i think with cyril gone and francis and gone dana white said it this might be the best heavyweight title fight in history and Honestly, I don't want to pat Dana White on the back. There's enough folks doing that already, but I think he's right in this case. I think this might be the best heavyweight title fight in history. I 100% agree, man. Gone are the days, yeah, when you have Tim Sylvia and fucking Andre Olosky fighting each other every weekend, as Dana puts it, man. Uh, those days are done, man. Like, the heavyweight division is finally getting some traction. Uh, you, you've got some serious contenders in there as well now. Um, yeah, it's a lot less shallow than it was before. And, you know, I, I think it's a perfect heavyweight matchup, man. Like, you've got one guy who's he's essentially a phenom, you know. And uh, a little backstory to Cyril Gon, which I think is just amazing. Uh, the guy's only been training since 23, man, 24. He was a salesman before. Yeah. Uh, he was about to lose his job or he lost his job. And I think thereafter, his friend was like, hey, man, like, you know, you're quite athletic. Uh, why don't you try Muay Thai? Two or three years later, man, he's got an excellent Muay Thai record. Um, and, you know, a couple of years after that, he's interim champion. Amazing story, man. Like, unbelievable. Would you say he's a phenom, like, to the levels of John Jones? Yeah, I yeah, I think he, yeah, that's, that's a good comparison, actually. Yeah, he is, but he doesn't get the same hype because he doesn't really speak a lot of English. He doesn't have that kind of, like... Uh, this guy seems like a badass kind of streak. Yeah. He just seems like a guy who likes to fight and he's extremely good at it. And yeah, he's absolutely a phenom. Within three years of taking a Muay Thai, he was beat. He beat the number one heavyweight in Muay Thai in the world and stayed undefeated. He then switched to MMA years on. He's still undefeated and he's not having close fights or anything like that. He is dominating oh, people. No, man. I mean, he's absolutely smashing. I mean, a little fact uh, for you guys as well. Uh, the guy was actually tipped to fight Rico Verhoeven in glory before the UFC signed him. So he was up, he was actually about what? to fight me. I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So he was about to fight him and uh UFC just poached him right before they're like, yeah, we're gonna get him, man. Fuck this. Like uh we're not even gonna wait, man. So it's it, and and they took him at three and oh or four and oh or something like that, which is unheard of. I mean, have you heard of a UFC uh, the UFC kind of signing someone who's only like three or four and oh? Never, hardly ever. Yeah, it's it, but it's guys. It's uh, we only remember the ones like John Jones and Cain Velasquez, and now one of the guys in that namesake is Cyril Gone, who was signed early, undefeated. He looked like a phenom, still is a phenom, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, man. I mean, th the thing the thing about him as well is he's so well rounded, and people keep forgetting like the first two submissions that he had. The, sorry, the first two wins uh, of his UFC career were actually submissions, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, one was against Rafael Pessoa, uh, who is a fucking brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt since 2007 so it's almost like he's showing off man he's like yeah like i'm just gonna outstrike you and then i want to take you down and then i want to submit you uh just because you know why not and <laughs> it's unbelievable man i think the guy is so gifted almost like a gsp type of well-roundedness in his game yeah and i think he, he trash talks about as well as gsp is doesn't he <laughs> Yeah, like, I've got nothing against Francis. Like, I'm cool, man. Like, no, you know, uh, he might not sell a lot of tickets, though. That's the only problem. But 
fantastic yeah. but he is he is an absolute striking phenom he does tons of really good things in there why don't you break it down this is you know what we're, but wait should we spend some time on francis i feel like we're, we're not burying the lead enough of like who are they gonna pick should we, spend, right, some, right. Okay, should look, we spend some time on francis the beauty the beauty about francis is is you know the francis 2.0 there isn't that much footage man on him and that's good yeah for him because as there's not that much footage um you know on france and you know what i mean by francis 2.0 i mean after that the uh the second loss in a low sorry the second loss in a in a row against Derek lewis uh he improved dramatically man like against curse blades like you could tell he was you know he was super nervous man like going into the second curse blades fight mm-hmm. but that overhand right is just death man uh, he clips you once and he didn't even clip him you know even cleanly uh and it just affected his equilibrium just knocked him out then you got the kane velasquez fight Cain Velasquez makes a mis- made a bit of a you know sloppy takedown, made a mistake. Francis caught him with a big short uppercut, boom, lights out, man, practically, and even blew his knee out. Mm-hmm. And then as you go down, you got the junior Dos Santos fight. He actually started this is when he started actually implementing um, leg kicks into his game plan. So the first three or four uh, strikes that Francis throws are heavy, heavy leg kicks, slow down. Well, I mean, he was probably just there to kind of slow down that movement, Dos Santos. And again, Desanos made a mistake overhand right, man. It's over. Francis and Garni versus Jarzinho. So here's one thing that I noticed a little bit. I, I don't know, like with this year, I kind of felt like this is a bit strange. The first when I watched this over again, I watched this like three or four times in a row. Uh, Jarzinho actually like lands two or three really strong leg kicks. And I, 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 this is my theory, and I might be wrong on this. So you know, just you guys don't attack me. I feel like Francis's leg might have been compromised within the first eight seconds. And uh, for that reason, he just thought, you know what, I'm going to have to knock this guy out quickly, man. My leg's going to be toast. And mm. he just literally charges in, knocks him the fuck out, man. Like, w- what did you think of that? Like, yeah. <laughs> It's a tough fight to watch because you really don't learn anything uh, like of either guy. And it doesn't help in this fight because it's probably, if you're doing tape study and you watch this, you think, oh, he kind of sucks. Like, I can beat all that. And even Jarzinho <laughs> Rosenstruck did every counter. Jarzinho Rosenstruck, and this is a Conor McGregor quote, from a fight perspective, one, because he landed 100%. He landed five for five. He landed every counter <laughs> in the yeah. way in. And it just doesn't matter because Francis walked through it. Uh, you might actually be right that his that his leg, his leg blew out because he does yeah. he does do a, a can almost, especially now 2.0, he does a kind of a peekaboo style, a very tight, he's, he's really down low and he puts a lot yeah. of weight on the lead leg, especially when he's closing distance. So if you throw a kick and time it well, he's putting all of his weight on it. You might actually have a really good point there that he blew his leg out, yeah. Yeah, I, I genuinely feel like that because it just seems so weird, man. Like, you know, the last few fights before that, he was patient, you know, high guard, like very, very, again, patience, 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 yeah. He didn't try and rush anyone. And with Jezinho, you know, who's probably the most violent kickboxer striker in the heavyweight division, you decide to rush him, it, you know, there, there must have been something going on, man. Like, that we don't know about. It's such a weird fight in history. So Eric Nixick was on with uh, Luke Thomas, I think, two months ago. And he, he had the same reaction of you and I with, they went in the back and both him and Francis said, like, that, that's not what we're working on. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Why'd you do that? Great knockout, like, Jesus, man. <laughs> that's not what we're trying to do here at all. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, go on. No, but I mean, as you go down, you got Stipe. I mean, that was that was a wonderful performance, man. But even then, like, there was some, I, I feel like with uh, Francis, he's got such a limited gas tank. And you almost saw it in that first round. He had his mouth open. He was a little tired, man, like even sprawling, um, you know, from that takedown from Stipe and landing heavy shots. Uh, I believe he clipped him a little bit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, even Stipe after the fight, he goes, yeah, I feel like uh, our game plan was working. Like we felt like Francis is getting tired. I just made a mistake. And that's the story, mm-hmm. man, of the last four opponents, man. Everyone has made a mistake against Francis. You are Curtis Blades, you made a mistake. Kane, Junior Desanis, Jazinho. Stipe all made mistakes here and they all played, played, sorry, they all paid the price with their consciousness. Now, moving forward, do you think Gon is going to make any mistakes? He's got five rounds to make one mistake. So we, first, first of all, that's really well said. That was really well put that he, he tends to 
exploit mistakes in people. Uh, a couple of things that I saw with with him, if I can throw it in, and then we'll kind of mix our an- analysis together. Oh, yeah, is yeah. He certainly thrives in exchanges, and he yeah. likes to be in the exchange where uh, for Cyril Gon will back away from an exchange and use distance defensively. Mm. Francis Ngannou stands in the pocket. And it, an example of this is the, uh, you remember the old Ar- Ar- Andre Arlovsky fight where Andre almost threw, he threw a big right hand and expecting yeah. Francis Ngannou to back away where you're supposed to. Instead, yeah. Francis Ngannou stood still and then just uppercutted him off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but if he backed away, he would have got clobbered with a big right hand, but instead he just stood yeah. there, right? Now, Cyril Ghosn, does he make mistakes? It, it, watching all of his fights in the UFC, no, he has not made any mistakes. There was a few times, uh, Derek Lewis, where he ducked in a bit too deep, but it's Derek Lewis. You can see the punches coming pretty clearly, but that's not even a mistake. It was defensively done, and it was done with absolutely no consequences. The only time I've ever seen anyone work against him is in the Volkov fight, where Volkov was using inside leg kicks as a counter to yeah. body and leg kicks. And this is something that Fedor Emelianenko was doing to Amir Krokop when he Krokop was throwing a, a kick to the body. His his leg, his support leg is showing, so you kick at the support leg, and that's what Volkov was doing. Um, but Volkov didn't find much success with it, and I don't know that Ngannou is going to find much success. But in the UFC, we've seen Cyril Gon make no mistakes he has stayed in control he's in the driver's seat every fight he's in man that is such a good point like you're absolutely right like the way he fights here so he fights with a very side-on stance Cyril Gon yeah very blade yeah when he's switching stances and something you've mentioned in the past as well it just leads him open to just getting kicked man like low kicks but for some reason he doesn't get kicked often often like I mean obviously Volkov landed quite a few on him um, but generally, man, he's switching up stances. He makes it confusing for the opponent and he doesn't allow an opponent to go to the well too much. So mm-hmm. say, for example, you've got a very good left body kick. You're not going to be able to throw that over and over again, man. He's going to keep switching stances on you uh, and confusing you. Do you think Francis mm-hmm. is able to land, you know, effective kicks against Gon? I mean, he's a good kicker, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. No, and I love what you said with the side on stance because he, he he's going to do a ta- teep entry or he's going to do a jab entry, and you never know because he's faking both at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's confusing, man, and it's there to it's there on purpose. And again, like the more Cyril Gon footage I saw, I, I saw so many kind of I saw so many similarities to John, man, like John Jones. Yeah, uh, the way he fights, you know, sh- switching stances, oblique kicks, long jabs. Um, He's got this. He's got this excellent lunging jab, yeah, and it kind of reminds me of how Rob, Rob Worker throws a jab as well. Yeah, um, everything is done perfectly, man. Like, how are you going to be a guy that makes no mistakes, man? It, it's difficult. So we've worked ourselves into a corner where we are, and like you said, can he do a leg leg kick game plan? So the ways to beat Cyril Gone would be a lot of leg kicks, especially on the stance switch, especially as a counter to when he, when he is kicking. Or trying to clinch and wrestle. We actually haven't seen him struggle against... We haven't really seen him against a wrestler, I guess, or a really good clincher, but we've seen him not struggle at all. And we are, have worked ourselves to a point of what we've talked about in the past with, is this fighter... Are we asking this fighter to fight in a way that he's never fought before? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Can Francis have gone do a leg kick heavy game plan? I haven't seen it in the UFC. So... I, I can't, I can't do, yeah, he's a D1 wrestler in the gym. I can't do that kind of like, just, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, let's just. Yeah, make yeah, 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 I get you, man. Like, yeah, I, I totally hear that. Because he he, does, he has thrown, you know, heavy leg kicks, but he's not the type of guy to stop you with leg kicks, if that makes sense. Like, he's not going to be the type of guy to, to stop you or, you know, to really hinder that leg to the point, yeah, where, you know, you've got to stop the fight or anything like that. But yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, so is he going to be able to do leg kicks? I really don't know. And But I would see that as the game plan and then wait for your right entries. Francis Ngannou does do some stuff very well, but I, uh, he hasn't had to work on a lot of things because of how bad the heavyweights are. Like Cyril Ghosn is a very good fighter, and I put notes that he, he has a speed of a middleweight, he has the speed of a welterweight, and has tactics as good as some of the guys in bantamweight when he's, especially defensively, he's so good. And... Francis Ngannou hasn't had to deal with someone who jabs extremely well, who or who uses yeah. teeth extremely well. You know what I mean? Where Fra- Cyril Gon is having to deal with Volkov. Francis Ngannou was charging in against Jarzinho Rosenstruck. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I'm not saying the level of competition isn't great, but when you when you look at the last you know few opponents for for Ngannou, I mean they're they're you know you, you got Cain Velasquez legend, Junior Dos Santos yeah. legend, yeah. But can you honestly say that you know they're slightly past their prime in a way, man? I mean, not even slightly, they are past their prime. Oh yeah, they're not anymore. They they you know they're kind of out of it. Jairzinho, he's good but very one dimensional. Yeah. Um, and then you got Stipe, again, someone who's almost the age of 40. Uh, you know, so he's fought three of the four last opponents have been a little bit out of their prime. Again, you know, this isn't a knock on uh Francis in Ghana or anything, but he's facing probably easily the most, you know, kind of dangerous opponent uh in the whole of the heavyweight division. Uh, probably ever, man. I, I can't who's more dangerous than than Cyril Ghana? I can't think of anyone right now in the UFC. Heavyweight division. No, he, he is the greatest striker in UFC heavyweight history. I have no doubt, no bones about it. Yeah, man. So sophisticated, man. And he, he's not going to be there, man, to be hit, man. That, that's the ultimate thing. Like, he just isn't going to be there to be hit. And, you know, the thing is, so um, mm-hmm. the thing with him as well is that he does have a plan B. Uh, he's got good enough. I feel like he's got good enough kind of, if he manages to get Ngana to the ground, he might even be able to pull off a submission, man. We don't, we don't know, man, because he's done it before. He's actually submitted people that were high level before as well. So there's a plan B in there as well. It's pretty. I think his plan A is probably going to be enough here because we've seen uh, the only weaknesses we've seen against Francis Ngannou are wrestling, of course, uh, but powerful outside leg kicks. Like Andre Arlovski mm-hmm. landed one. Junior Dos Santos dropped him with a leg kick. Yeah, yeah, he sweeped him. That was beautiful. Now, now imagine. Cyril gone doing that like in all roads in all oh. of my hypotheticals I still kind of come back I come back to the same point of Cyril gone is the clear favorite in this fight unless and they could be working a game plan in the gym that we we haven't seen him fight we haven't seen him fight in that way before and that could be that could be very good he has a really good gym with Eric Nix I can go uh yeah. but from what we've seen in the cage, all roads hypothetically lead to Cyril Gone. But in the gym, he has been training with uh, Rico Verhoeven. The, like, imagine, yeah. okay, so 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 the, this is like <laughs> Francis and Ganu's sparring partners have been Rico Verhoeven and Cyril Gone. Those are pretty good sparring partners if you're about to fight Cyril Gone, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, man. I mean, you you need that level of competition, especially. I mean, I only found that out today, man. Like, you know, if I can. Mm-hmm. Gone was going to fight Rico as well. So Rico's already had a bit of, yeah, he's already had a bit of, um, you know, kind of research on, on Gone. And obviously Rico is the, the greatest kickboxer in the world right now, a heavyweight for sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, so, you know, when you got, when you couple those things, man, it's, it's really just about how much has Francis improved? I mean, he's clearly improved, yeah, from the first Stipe fight to the second. So we know, yeah, that he's got that ability to evolve and, you know, change and, get better uh but is he good enough to be gone and you know as as much as i almost want to see francis win because you know i, I like the fact that there's a bit of beef with dana white kind of hypes the fire uh, yeah uh, so the fire up a little bit yeah because he's like oh, i'm not getting paid enough man i'm not fighting for 500 500 anymore man i like, fuck that mm-hmm. like it'll be st- how cool would it be if he knocks out cyril gone and he goes yeah i'm just gonna go to one fc or like uh bellator now like uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is uh, when we when we were analyzing the fights and like doing other shows and things like this this is also a talking point i didn't really want to get into because we we don't quite know enough about what's what the actual conversation in the back room is because yeah, zero uh, uh francis and whose management team is very good and they are they are experts uh they're very good at what they're doing but they haven't actually worked with the ufc before so i don't know you know what that I don't know if it's them. I don't know if it's, it's, it's probably a little bit of both, but we used to see in the past, uh, George St. Pierre is the example. And I like a bunch of other guys, like Nick Diaz, I think was one where they do, couldn't deal with Dana White. So they got Lorenzo Fertitta to come in and negotiate. Like George St. Pierre never spoke to Dana. They just, they don't get on, uh, but they spoke to Lorenzo Fertitta quite a bit. Now with the current management style of the USC, I don't know. Lorenzo's not around. He doesn't work here anymore. Right. Like, yeah. so do we just let him go and, like get beat up by the boxing heavyweight champion Dyson Fury because he oh, would man. no doubt no doubt like this is that's just silly man like I, I don't know why people are like yeah you know what Francis clips him once like shut the fuck up man like just shut no. up please. <laughs> <It's> just... 
<laughs> he's like he doesn't have a prayer in hell man like i'm no. sorry like this is boxing man they they just train hands man all day every day and if tyson fury can get up from a punch from wilder i'm sure he can get up from a punch from Nganu. and i i'm gonna say here man i think wilder probably hits harder than than Nganu as a boxer as a boxer yeah. purely as a boxer with those gloves oh like, i speak you know yeah. it's just different I, I totally agree with you, honestly. I, I'm absolutely co-signed that you're talking about this guy who hits as hard as like moving vehicles. And then, no, I don't think that's a real thing. But I, yeah, uh, DeAndre Wilder absolutely hits harder. And guys in boxing, they're in their late careers at this point. Uh, Tyson Fury has been fighting heavyweights his whole career. You think he hasn't fought a brawler before? He can beat yeah, a brawler, on. you know? Come on, it's so ridiculous. And like, I just, I mean, look, I, I, I would, if that happens, I would root for Francis, but I definitely wouldn't watch it, man, because I know what's going to happen, you know. Fury is a, he's a very, very good boxer with amazing movement and, you know, really good head movement, blah, blah, blah. He, like, he's just, everything is perfect about Fury. And he's already gone through the fire uh, mm -hmm. with a huge, huge puncher in, uh, in Wilder. So I don't know. I just think it's just silly. I think it's just a way of, uh, you know, Francis and Ghana to kind of get a bit more money and leverage maybe. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I hope he's not being realistic. However, but it's also very sad to say that we were talking about how prestigious the UFC heavyweight title is. And it really is. It's a very prestigious, it's a good title. It's a very good championship. Um, unlike the flyweight, which is kind of, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's a good championship. And, and, <laughs> Like, I do want him to get paid, and if he went to boxing, he could do one fight and probably make more money than he would being a UFC heavyweight champion for an entire career, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. in 10 fights, he might make the same getting beat up by Tyson Fury, and that's that kind of sucks, and I, I wish him all the best, and I want him to make money, but... Yeah, flyweight sucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> flyweight sucks. I mean, they can never headline. They can never headline a pay per view, man, which is sad. Um, let you know, let me throw you some hypotheticals here. We got Brandon Moreno and um, uh, Devison Figueroa. I think we did this the last. This is why we didn't bother talking about it because this is the same notes I still have from the last time they fought. I don't think we've learned anything. But like Demetrius Johnson, he comes back to the UFC. Does he beat both of these guys, even in his old man oh. form? Probably. I don't know, man. You know what? Like, I probably say no, just because Demetrius Johnson is like almost thirty-five now. He's a little bit older. Um, you know, he's a bit more well, you know, weather-worn. If that makes sense. And I just, I think it's just more more to do with him being a little bit out of his prime. Not not greatly so. I just think, you know, he's at the latter end of his career. I think Henry Cejudo would beat him in a trilogy match for sure great 100%. example great example yeah. of if henry cejudo came out of retirement today yeah he definitely beats uh, uh demetrius johnson he probably beats both of these guys in a title fight this weekend anyway we should move on <laughs> <laughs> before we get yeah. into it. changing gears though man this uh, obviously you know the ufc had his first uh, event in of the year in fact and man mm -hmm. what a fucking main event man calvin Kayer versus giga and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was so wrong on that. I, I, I'm so glad I didn't put any money on that because I probably would have put a decent amount of, of money on Giga Chikadze. Everyone was rooting for Ch Giga. Um, mm -hmm. What a story, man. Calvin K taking the beating of uh, 2021 and then putting the beating or p potential beating of someone in 2022, man. What did you think of that? <laughs> No, I totally cozy with you. Getting the first fight, he was the first event last year, and he got beat up by Max Holloway. Didn't took a year off, which was a really wise decision for him, and now came back in the first event of this year, almost to the day as well. And in a fight that was supposed to be a losing fight, he was fighting a guy who was faster, had more tools, had more power, and he followed a game plan perfectly. There was a few really good key moments in this fight in which you could see him gain confidence and learn a couple of things. So first of all, they're clearly crowding the kicker, which is a great yes. game plan. Give the kicker no room to breathe so they can't, you know, kick. Um, and he also was picking up on the same striking habits where Giga Chikese is a very good striker, but he also throws the same three strikes over and over again. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, he overextends on one twos. And that's where, especially in the first couple of rounds with, um, where Qatar was having, Cater was having a success there and more so in the later rounds, but the overextending on the one twos, he was finding the opening. One thing I was talking about it with, uh, with our friend, the renegade, Coney Gibson, he said at Kings MMA, where, where Giga Chikedzi trains, they do hard sparring and they go hundred percent in sparring. And mm -hmm. I remember years ago, 
with regarding hard sparring is that guys tend to lean on what they do well rather than exploring new things and this is what Robbie Lawler had talked about where he got better he said I stopped sparring because in sparring I just was doing what I was good at rather yeah. than developing my overall game so with Giga Chikedze you can almost see that where he's developed three really good things and he bases his whole game around it uh, and Qatar was able to beat it and what a comeback yeah. for this guy like where do, what does he do next at featherweight it's a great division I mean what a beautiful performance, man. Like just mm-hmm. everything about it, like the elbows, the, I, I, I can't, I was actually ruling out Calvin Kaya completely, man. I, I didn't no. think he was coming back. Yeah. I mean, everyone did, man. They're like, what the hell, man? Like, whoa, what the hell? I think a lot of people probably lost money on that, but yeah, I mean, just moving forward, I'd love to see Calvin Kaya fight someone like Yaya Rodriguez. Uh, I saw a few people putting him and Brian Ortega in the same, you know, kind of conversation. That would also be a great fight. Yeah, I mean, there's just tons of matchups, really. What would you most, you know, be interested to see? Uh, Calvin Kay against who? Yeah, I love featherweight, but here's the problem with featherweight. The guys in the top uh, top five, Brian Ortega, Yair Rodriguez, and Chad Sung Jung. So Chad Sung Jung, he's got a title shot. Great, cool. Korean yeah. Zombie is booked. Uh, Brian Ortega, Yair Rod- Rodriguez. These guys don't fight. These guys have had two fights in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so Calvin I, I think they were just like, oh. Chan, yeah, you've not had a title shot and, you know, everyone loves you. You're a fan favorite in Korea. We need a Korean star, man. You want to fight Volk? <laughs> yeah, dude, if if they phoned me today, I'd be like, yeah, I'll fight. Yeah, I'll fight. Him. Yeah, no problem at all. You gotta represent I'll, Canada. Yeah, I'll get beat up. No problem. I don't mind. Um, but yeah, so Brian Ortega, Yair Rodriguez, either of those fights are good. I, I particularly like the Yair Rodriguez because I think Qatar's game plan might actually work against him quite effectively. Yeah. But yeah, you never fights. He doesn't fight. He's always out on injury. When are we going to book it? In two years from now? Yeah, I know, man. I mean, like, they were quite, I think Yaya was even saying, yeah, I'll be up for that. But mm. it's hard, man. Like, I think Calvin Kay, do you know something? He, you could really tell he had a plan B in, this, in the, uh, the last fight. I mean, his mm. plan A worked beautifully, which is just crowd the kicker, you know, going with elbows, spinning elbows, ducking uh, uppercuts, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but yeah, he definitely had a plan B, which was to wrestle. And you saw it in that first round. Uh, Giga just tripped up and fell down, kind of fell down and get, uh, you know, and he was like, I was like, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to capitalize on this because I've definitely been working on top position. And you can tell. So I think he's a bit more well-rounded than he was last year. I reckon Calvin would probably beat Yaya, man, uh, looking at the last footage. Yeah, and I agree with that. Just based on game plans, just the way they fought. Uh, maybe the Brian Ortega is a little bit more of an interesting one. But again, same thing. Two years from now, we're talking about this fight. So I don't actually know what to do with the top five, but it's exciting. It's a great time. Uh, facing back the other way, Giga Chikedzi. Is there an... Oh, someone... Zabit, baby. Zabit. 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 Man, yeah. man, this, is, the, this is the same problem, but worse. Where the hell is Zabit at? Where you... <laughs> Zabit might be even be retired now. We have no idea. Like he's not been, he's not fought yet since. Okay, here's a little. <laughs> yeah, I know. The last time he fought, we didn't even know what COVID was. Yeah, that's how long ago. <laughs> that's how long ago it was. You know, it's been a long, long time, man. For Zabit, and I think he's had some health issues as well. So yeah, it, it might be a, a few more months before he's back in the title picture, but. Or not even a title picture, just a fight, man. Like he he needs a tune-up fight, and um, yeah, I, I'd love to see that matchup, man. Zabit versus Giga. Um, you know, is that something you'd want to watch if they were both 100? percent Hell yeah, that sounds awesome. Oh man, what a great fight that would be. I'd be 100 percent into that. Sean Shelby should just give up his job and just give it give it to us, man. Honestly, just us fawning over like, yeah, what a fight. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, I also think Calvin Qatar versus a Josh Emmett. Of like, just give them fight oh, of the year, right? Like, yeah. that's a fight of the year right there. That would be awesome, man. Featherweight is pretty banging, man. Like, it's got some bangers. Like, I'd say yeah. Bantamweight is the best division in the UFC in terms of talent. Absolutely. But I say Featherweight is probably second right now. I totally agree with you. I think you're bang on with that. Yeah, that band, that band, we can talk about Bantamweight forever. <laughs> so- I know, we love Bantamweight, man. We, we can literally just talk about, like, we can have, we can have three or four legit world, if it was like boxing, we can have three or four legit world champions in Bantamweight, man, honestly. It's so good. It's such a good weight class. But yeah, so Bantamweight's good. Featherweight's looking really good. Anything else on the fight night card? Do you want to talk about Caitlin Chukagan and she hasn't re-signed with the UFC at this point? Is there anything... Do you care? 
I mean, I'll be honest, man. I just, I just got, so, <laughs> I just got the, literally saw the main event. I mean, yeah, fill me on in that, man. I, I have no idea. Oh no, I don't care either. I was wondering if you care. <laughs> <laughs> you just be polite to Caitlin. You're like, whatever, man. Whatever. I don't know. Like, what, what, she, got, she got caught. No, so, so she's. This is the thing with Caitlin Chukagan is that she she's actually beaten most of the top ten at this point. She's on a win streak. She's ranked second yeah. in her division. And with that on paper, you would think, oh, she'll see five fights Shevchenko next. No, like none of us want to see that. None of us are excited for that. None of us would be into that. But she is the contender of this weight class. But the UFC actually hasn't signed her at this point. So that was the last fight on her contract, and they haven't given her an offer. Uh, so I, I guess the UFC maybe is done with the her or the division yeah maybe i I mean if i was the ufc i'd be like look you want to fight the uh you want to go up in weight valentina you know it's um it's possible to be a double champ now because you know nunez is gone i I mean look if she was to fight nunez a third time you know you never know she might have taken it but true yeah it's an interesting one man i think that flyweight division is basically toast I think you're probably correct about that. Yeah, it's a. I, I don't know what the UFC wants to do with it, but I, I've seen them rumored that they might be bringing in women's atom weight, which would be great. For that's really, that's, yeah, that's that's actually a better yeah. division overall. Um, but yeah, I think it comes with the same problem of like this is another title, but they're not selling a pay per view, they're not giving you know, like women's flyweight, women's atom weight, they're not going to sell a pay per view in any way. No, absolutely not, man. Absolutely not. I, I think it's just to do with. You know, smaller fighters in general, they just don't sell as much, man. People want to see the bigger boys fight. Uh, and that's just the way it is. And, you know, that only changed maybe, I mean, featherweight onwards, people are a bit more excited about that because, you know, arguably because of Connor, you know, he made that featherweight division what it is today, in my opinion. Like, he made it as popular as it is today, uh, mm. if that makes sense. But, yeah, man, no one wants to see flyweights fight, unfortunately, man. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So there, there is some interesting things that I want to throw at you here that we've had uh at, with flyweight it came into sorry let's back up what the ufc tends to do is allow divisions to develop like what we've seen with uh, the women's divisions when they introduced them give this time and it will develop and we saw that with the ufc's lightweight division where they uh they they had it they got rid of it when they brought it back the second time with jens pulver and bj pan and jen and uh and joe lazon they essentially said like give us time to develop it no one likes yeah, sean yeah. give no one likes sean shirt but let us develop it so within 10 years <laughs> So think about the UFC's lightweight division. Within 10 years, you went from Sean Shirk to Conor McGregor. Yeah. That's and awesome. flyweight, we've also had it for 10 years. You haven't seen it develop. Like even Bantamweight yeah, has really developed. All, what is going all. on with men's flyweight? It hasn't developed yeah. or anything like that. I think it's just because, I, and you know, correct me if you think I'm just talking shit, yeah. I feel like the average fan, UFC fans, like, oh man, they're just a bunch of fucking midgets, man. I'll fucking take them out. And it's like, that's genuinely how I feel. Like, I feel like people don't take these guys as serious fighters. They just, because they're just small dudes. But, you know, I, I don't know. Like outside, outside of fight, you know, fighting. If they were to, you know, fight this three hundred pound bouncer, you know, in a club, they probably would destroy them, man. And you know, they're just not given the uh, amount of respect I feel just because of their size. Yeah, I think you're largely correct about that. And even within the community, I think we've had moments where someone admits that they just don't care about flyweight. And did you work <laughs> in the industry? But um, this is the thing we used to have the discussion on these guys at 145 and 155 and now those are amazing divisions 135 is super good and i think everyone would be surprised if you met manny pacquiao or a floyd mayweather like these, these guys are way smaller than you think they are in real mm-hmm. life but they can certainly sell but we've given them a decade to really develop that men's flyweight division and we haven't seen any development not in terms of sales not in terms of stars not in terms of really anything have we I mean, even even uh, Dana White, man, he was looking to kill that division, man, with TJ Dillashaw. Like, remember that? Yeah. TJ, like he 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 knew what he was doing, man. He's like, yeah, we're probably gonna have TJ take the belt, and TJ's like, yeah, he was openly saying, I'm gonna destroy this division. I'm gonna vacate the belt. <laughs> you know, the division will be no more. Um, and you know, I'll just move back to Bantamweight. And you know, I think Henry Cejudo kept it alive for a bit longer, which was yeah. nice, but. Yeah, um, Dan is probably just still pissed off with him. That's why he's not going to pay him any more money. I think you're right about that. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I can't weigh in any more than that. I think we, I think we've left the UFC title talk. I was like, damn, I don't want to talk about flyweights. I just want to talk about the title fight. <laughs> yeah, I messed great, up. Great, like, 
tangent, man. Great tangent. But uh, yeah. hey, you you know, UFC 270 main event is a wrap. Um, yeah. Any anything else to discuss? We pretty much yeah, I think that's that's basically it. No, I think it's gonna be a great fight. We're both picking Cyril gone like, in every single way that every single uh route that we have talked about. There's it just leads back. All titles lead to Cyril Gone. The UFC heavyweight title is a really good one. I have nothing else to throw in. Uh, Tim Wheaton MMA, Twitter, Instagram, all that good, good stuff. Kafka Exports, it's on every platform. Make sure to check it out. Uh, Ash, last word. Where can the people find more of you and all that good stuff? Yeah, so guys, uh, you know, follow me on ashmma.cks. Make sure that you, you know, like and subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, we haven't decided whether we're going to put this on IG. I think we're going to come back with a bit of comeback on IGTV. Um, but yeah, you guys just keep liking, keep subscribing, keep following the page. And we'll see you soon.